Take a Bible. We'll be in the King James till eternity. Nothing else but Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're going to start getting serious. <clears throat> we're going to beat up on the women first and then the men afterward. Hooray. All the things that nobody likes to hear. Things the Southern Baptist Convention had to, had to make a statement saying we have to follow the scriptures. Poor Southern Baptist Convention. I thought it was just assumed you go into a church and you're going to hear the Bible. Amen? Without comment, without someone saying it doesn't mean this, it means something else. Let's just read it and believe it for what it says. I promise you there are blessings upon blessings to the person, man or woman, adult or child, young one or aged one, rich or poor, free and bond. There's something in here that touches on every part of our life. And if we will live by these things, God will make us happy people. Happy are ye if you do them. That's what it says. And uh, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen? All right, keep that in mind, ladies. It's your turn. Um, you know, while I'm thinking about it, um, I have a passage of Scripture in mind. And I think I'm going to, injected into this um, but I don't quite know where it's at but it's the um, it's the Bible telling us the Apostle Paul I think uh, where the the older women are to here we go Titus Titus here we go let me read this to you. Turn in your Bible to Titus if you want to. Titus chapter 2. Um, this is a really good scripture for all of the adults of our church to give heed to. Um, I don't talk a whole lot about some things I've been through in this church, whether I was a, a, a boy growing up, a young man, um, learning life as it comes, uh, and then the things that I've seen as a pastor. Some things I talk about, uh, I don't talk about very much the transition uh, in 1996 that led me to end up in the pastor's office. It was a horrible, horrible time for me personally, for the church. Uh, we had a pastor that absolutely he had some kind of mental illness and he went crazy and it was it was a horrible time and um, it's just bad I don't talk about it much when I was younger 19 I'm gonna say right around 1979 um, I was about 13 years old. I was in the 8th grade. I had gone to Twin City Christian Academy for a year in the 7th grade, and I wanted to go back. I did not want to go to public school, so I started the 8th grade at the Christian school, and right after that, around October, November, um, there arose quite a dissension against the pastor that we had. He was from North Carolina, him and his wife. He had a daughter that was my age and a son that was a few years younger than me. And needless to say, I was friends with the kids, but I, I was really close to the pastor. And I could see how God was 
you know, shaping me at the time because I, I, I liked the pastor. I wanted to be, you know, with him. We did, uh, you know, we had a lot of snow that winter and I helped him always with the parking lot and everything. We did all kinds of stuff together. I'd go on visitation with him and things like that. Well, there, was, there arose some people that had been here for a long time and they didn't like him. And so they waited until he went to the denominational national meeting, wherever it was that year, they waited for him to leave so they could have a meeting behind his back. And while he was gone, uh, there was a group of people, some of them were on the board, even women at that time, and they uh, decided they wanted to have a vote of confidence on him because they didn't like him. And um, I remember one business meeting that everything fell apart in here. And I saw people that I had grown up under, people that I sat in their Sunday school class. One of the ladies that was one of the ringleaders of the coup was my teacher at Twin City. And the, the things got so bad. There was a, a business meeting on a Wednesday night and people were yelling they were lobbing all of these charges against the pastor, and it wasn't anything immoral or anything like that. They didn't like some of his standards that he had for himself and how he thought other people should live. They didn't like that. And so they were going to drive him out because he had offended somebody. And so um, I watched people that I looked up to and people that I loved, people that I thought were great people uh, just do some very ungodly things in a business meeting. Um, one of the trustees' wives, we had a deacon at the time, Dale McCurry, who was one of the most godly men I've ever known in my life. Uh, he loved being saved. He did. Very good piano player, good teacher, and a uh, very humble man. He was in he stood in favor with the pastor. And um, he was giving some comments. I don't know what he said. But one of the Jezebel ladies got up in the meeting, walked over to him and slapped him on the face for what he was saying. And uh, her husband just sitting there, letting her do it, not saying a word. And um, it, was a, it was an awful time. Bottom line was that they held a vote of confidence on him. He won the vote. And in the rules, if a group of people or one person uh, wants to hold calls for a vote of confidence on the pastor, if the pastor wins, then he has the right to call a vote of confidence on that particular member. And so uh, I think that was done. I'm not positive. I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, there was a, quite a few people that left the church, quite a few people that stayed. One of the people that left was my school teacher. And so um, I didn't understand it at the time. I do now. But my mom made the decision that I probably would not be in good shape staying in her classroom. So I had to leave the school that I loved and I had to go back to public school. But all of that was a result of sin, and it's the sin of pride. Uh, it says, I'm right, no matter what, and you're wrong, and I'm not budging. And, it, and again, we're not talking about, is Jesus God? We're not talking about, is salvation by the blood? Nothing like that. Nothing important. Okay? Nothing important. No immorality. No, he wasn't a drinker. He wasn't a woman chaser. He was none of that. And uh, they wanted to force him out to get somebody in that they, I guess, they wanted to control. And so anyway, um, when Preacher Golf came in, uh, he did a lot to um, uh, take care of some of the matters in how the church is run uh, and there was a rule put in the place that um, nobody can call for a, a board meeting, trustees or deacons or anything like that, 
without the pastor's knowledge, consent, and if possible, his uh, appearance. Uh, that came in handy when uh, the first, no, not the first year, the, in 2014 when we went to Kenya, Mike Hutzel, Brent Hutzel, and me, and of course Michael, and while we were there, there was a man in the church that had moved here, him and his wife, him and his fifth wife, uh, moved here, and I always suspected that he had eyes on the pulpit. He always talked to me about how he, his other preachers used to, he had gone to several churches, and um, how his preachers would always let him preach and stuff like that. I just didn't feel right about it. While I was gone, uh, we had an issue with the young man that was preaching in my place. Some of you remember it. And um, when I was informed about it, uh, I dealt with it, with the young man in particular, told him what I wanted, and um, it should have remained that way, but uh, this man decided that um, he was going to put the young man out while I was gone and have the pulpit for himself. So he calls Brother Sterling, and he says, uh, I think we need to get the board together and have a meeting and have this young man put out. Sterling knew. Sterling knew the, the guidelines, and he said, we're not having any meeting without the pastor here. That's in our bylaws, and if you, if you want to wait till Mike gets back, you can call all the board meetings you want. But for now, we're not having one. And he said, Mike's already talked to him. He's made it clear what he wants. And uh, it's going to be that way until he gets back. Well, this didn't satisfy him because he said, I guess I'll be next in line for the pulpit. That's what he wanted. And so there was only like one Wednesday night service left, or maybe one Sunday too. And... Uh, that Wednesday night service, the young man did what I told him to do. He apologized to the church. And all of a sudden now, he's getting these people standing up. It was a man and his wife and his, um, yes, his, her daughter and son-in-law. They raked that young man over the coals publicly in front of everybody. Right there, they're wrong. Right there, they're wrong. It should have been dealt with privately, like I did. And um, it, was, it was awful. I, I, I swore, having watched this go on when I was a kid, this is never going to happen while I'm here. And, I mean, if I have to, if I have to leave and quit, I'm leaving and quitting. Uh, but I'm not going to drag this church through some kind of nasty business. I won't do it. And uh, it was just awful. But what it is, it's pride that gets in the way. And we think we're right on something. And we're going to impose our beliefs, our ideologies on everybody else, whether they like it or not. And I was talking with John in the office before church this evening. Something I've learned with people in a church setting is patience. Let God do his perfect work in their life and uh, feed them and teach them. And some people just don't know better. And uh, I've seen that pay off in some pretty good ways. Uh, some of them I can't talk about because there's just situations you don't know about. But I've seen God do absolutely miracles with people's lives, having patience with them. And uh, every now and then you've got you to gotta put your foot down and say this is enough. You know, we can't go on like this. But it has to do with, uh, let me read this, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So it's what I'm, I intend to do, is to give you as much of the Bible as I possibly can in the time that I have in this world. So I'm going to speak the things that are sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober. That means both ways. Sober-minded, that means that you are serious about your relationship with God and serious about the church, and, and this is not just a pastime to you. This is your life. The age of, but it also means don't drink. Don't get drunk. The aged men be sober, grave, temperate, 
sound in faith, in charity. Don't forget that. Notice that he put them together. If you don't love people with an unconditional love, you have no right to say anything against them. As far as church is concerned. I can talk about, you know, how the sodomites and the transgender are taken over. I watched a girls' basketball game where they let a six-foot-three-inch transgendered man, boy, in a girls' basketball game, and he caused injuries to two of the players of the other team. I would not put up with that. Not for a second would I put up with that. So I can talk about that. But in charity... Charity is God's unconditional love for other people where you love them and you give to them no matter whether you think it's going to pay off in the end or not. Christ died for every man, woman, and child, but most people are going to snub their nose at God, spit in his face, say he doesn't exist, say it doesn't matter, and we're crazy for following this voodoo religion and just go on about their lives, and yet Christ died for every one of them too. Faith and charity and patience. There it is. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. I dare say that woman that jumped up and slapped that deacon in the face. I would not want to be her. In judgment day, if she has not repented, I would not want to be her. She violated biblical authority. On several levels. Number one, a deacon. You just don't, sl don't slap the deacons. Say amen, John. Don't slap the deacons. Gloria, if you're listening, don't slap the deacons. Um, don't hit the preacher either. Um, but she violated that. She went against deacons. She went against biblical authority. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let the women remain silent. And one of the problems was there, there has been in the past, they had a trustee board that consisted of men and women. And I just don't do it that way. I think, I think the, um, the, the responsibility of leadership clearly in the scripture falls upon the men. Uh, women are totally useful in everything that the church does. I do not want anybody to say or think that I think otherwise because clearly I don't. My reputation says I don't. And so anytime I teach something like this, I always have to feel like I got to bend over backwards and say things three or four times in a row so you understand I'm not out trying to do a hit on all the women. I'm not part of the He-Man Woman Haters Club, okay? But anyway, your job, ladies, the aged women, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers. There was another thing that she violated. Not given to much wine. Now, I've stayed at that woman's house because her son was my age. We played together. And... Um, I had, I had spent quite a bit of time over there because mom and dad was both in the hospital at that time or my dad was out of town, I don't remember. But I stayed over there for about a week and we were snowed in for part of that. And I always thought they were good people. I, but I don't, I don't suspect that she was given to wine or anything like that. Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. To love their children. To be discreet. That means you don't talk about your woman stuff in front of everybody. I'm going to wait. Chaste. It means you have a purity of heart, mind, motive, and mouth. Purity. Keepers at home. That's another one. Good. Obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. 
Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all, now it's, guys, it's our job to show the young men how to be, how to treat women. Um, chivalry, opening the door for ladies, standing up when a lady comes into a room, tipping your hat. These are things that have just gone by the wayside now. Of course, a lot of ladies don't act like ladies much anymore. Uh, but in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. What are you known by? Are you known by the things that you do wrong, or are you known by the things that you do right? You can't always change what some people think about you, but you can sure try. And I would, I would fall on the side of trying hard to show people that you have a pattern of good works. It's not an off thing when you do something right. It's normal for you to do that. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. And how can you be uncorrupt in doctrine if your Bible's corrupt? Think about that one for a while. Gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Sterling and I went down um, several years ago. Brother John Uter had, uh, was pastoring a church down there, and I had, I had, he called me down to do some teaching down at his church, and I did. And we had a pretty good time, but not too long after that, um, they had a, a, a vote of confidence. There was, there was three people on a trustee board, and one of them was the former pastor. Big mistake. Big mistake. And uh, he led a sort of a coup against Brother John, and they had a vote of confidence meeting on the pastor. He won by overwhelming majority. The only people who voted against him was the three trustee members and their wives. Then he called, he was going to call for a vote of confidence. Well, those people stood up and said, there's no need calling a vote of confidence on us. We're leaving. You can cancel us right now. So they walked out of the building that Sunday night. So as far as John is concerned and the church is concerned, their names are not on the membership list anymore. Well, he delivers the mail next door, next day to them. And they said, this is not over. And John said, well, it is. You, you resigned out of, out of the church. You're no longer members. Oh, yeah, we still are. It's not official. And you know what they did? The next Sunday, they called everybody in their family, everybody in their family's family, anybody who had ever been to that church, they designated them as members, and they loaded that church up with people the next Sunday morning. And here they come in between Sunday school and church. One of them, and then sheriff's deputy showed up. And I know this for a fact because the lady admitted to doing it. One guy got right up in John's face and was yelling at him and screaming at him. What they wanted to do was for John to get angry and push the guy back. The sheriff's deputy would then arrest him for assault and have him let out in handcuffs. They had, one lady admitted, because she's the one that called the deputy. The next day, Monday, John tells me all this. Me and Sterling drive all the way down to Lebanon, and we're just there to be his friends. And I, this, what made me think of this, having no evil thing to say of you. We sat and just let John talk and get things out of his, and he was telling about things they had accused him of, and he said, Mike, I never did that. And something else they accused him of, and he said, I, I didn't do that either. Next thing we know... His daughter, she, he had an adult daughter living with him. She come down the steps crying, what's the matter? I just got fired from my job. She worked at a factory there in Lebanon. They got a lot of factories in Lebanon. They, they build boats there and stuff like that. And she said, somebody called in a bomb threat to the plant, and they're accusing me of doing it. She said, I didn't do that. That's my job. And John just kept going, they're, they're, everything they accuse us of, we didn't do. And the Holy Ghost said, Mike, do this. I said, John, have you ever done anything wrong since you've been in the ministry? He said, yeah. I said, are they accusing you of that? He said, no. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. And I said, it just came to me, John, they can't accuse you of what you have done because 
then you wouldn't be able to stand against it. You'd have to say, yeah, I did that, and you'd resign. I said, but God has already forgiven you, and he's covered that sin. He won't let the devil use it against you. And that, that thing there, having no evil thing to say of you, God would literally, now I saw it with my own eyes, God would not let the people that were against him accuse him of things that he said he had, he had done, he admitted. I had done things wrong. I didn't ask him what it was, it was none of my business. But they didn't accuse him of that. I said, they, they can't have it. They, God won't let them have it. And I said, to me, God's clearly on your side, John. And um, we've been good friends for years, and I love the man. So anyway, that's the pretext of where we're going tonight. Uh, let's bow for prayer. Let me read this very quickly. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Father, we ask your blessings, Lord. And Lord, I don't mean to just complain about things I've seen. Lord, all of that happened for a reason. And, um, Lord, I've loved people and cared for people that would not give me the time of day to this very day. I've felt the coldness. I've seen the looks. And these are people, Lord, that I loved and would have given everything that I can to them and for them. But, Father, things happen. You know this world. We're all sinners. And while they may not be able to be upset with me on things that uh, I have done, they still get upset no matter what. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us all to learn what charity is, to learn how to serve one another and be a servant to people, um, even people, Lord, that don't love us, people that hate us. Lord, Father, just it, it, we can't do it in our flesh. It's not there. But Lord, in our spirit, uh, would you help us and enable us to forgive people that have done us wrong, forgive people that have hurt us, even if they never ask. In our minds, we've cleared them, and um, we don't have to go back on that anymore. It's a burden that we can't carry. And it's something that you put in the prayer for us that we to for, for you to forgive our debts as we forgive those who are debtors against us. So, Father, Lord, teach us what we need to know. Help us, to God, to be an example to these children, the right example. They're going to learn enough from the world already. Help us as... They're role models, they're mentors. Lord, I understand what it's like to be a little boy looking up at all these adults in the church. And I just thought the world of them. So, Father, Lord, help us do that and not be offensive to people in an unduly matter. Bless us tonight, bless your word in Jesus' name, amen. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There's some verses that back that up. If you look in Galatians chapter 6, it almost looks like a contradiction in Galatians. That was something I learned years ago. Um, I wrote a, a term paper on the book of Galatians. I was pretty good at writing term papers. And I charged a dollar a page. I didn't, I didn't write somebody's paper, but I typed them. And I had, a, I had a good quality printer back then. I had a spell check on my Commodore computer. Man, I was with it. And I was getting pizza money. Five bucks, man, that's pizza money right there. You could get two Little Caesars for five bucks back then. Pizza, pizza. All right. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, now look at this. It's not, this is not to lost people. It's to the church. Brethren. If a man be overtaken in a fault, so let's, let's just say that Chris is overtaken in a fault. It's your fault, Chris. You did it. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Notice this. Leave the carnality out of it. Put your flesh aside. This is not somebody you're going to come in judgment over. This is somebody you're going to try to help rescue. 
When they wheel people into the emergency room with gunshot wounds, the doctor doesn't ask what he did to deserve a gunshot wound. Doesn't ask if he's a gang member, doesn't ask if he's been on drugs other than for the medical information that he needs. He is going to try to get this person, keep them alive. And it doesn't matter to him what kind of person they were, what they did or what they didn't do. It says it should be that way with us. When people falter in the church, then let's go to them privately secretly to try to maintain their um their uh what's the word i'm trying to think of Re reputation amongst other people if we possibly can uh and if someone is overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual he's telling you i don't want somebody that's carnal that's judging everybody all the time that's always wanting to point an accusing finger and you always have people like that uh, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. He did not say judge them. He did not say cast them out. He didn't say anything like that. He said restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Several, several, several years ago, we had a, um, uh, a couple of young, uh, young new converts, I'll say, uh, they were about my age, maybe a little bit older. Uh, there was a man that, that started coming, and he was trying to get his life in order and follow the scriptures. And then a woman, they ended up getting married, by the way. But anyway, a woman started coming, and both were sort of the same way. They'd lived a life of sin, and one of them was in, had done drugs. And I think the guy had drank and ruined his life and stuff like that and wanted a second chance. Well, they were in, they were in here, and I was trying to teach them and so on. And then we had an older couple... They were already retired. Both of them um, were on a disability, Social Security. And the disability was like a, a mental disability. I don't know exactly what all it was. But they both had some mental problems. They, they weren't, you know, slow or anything like that. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was. But they were just normal to talk to. Well, they started coming, the man and the woman, and um, I talked to them a little bit and found out they weren't married. They were just living together and not being married. And um, so this, this young, this new convert, he found that out and he had a problem with it. And I could sense that he felt like they shouldn't be allowed to come. And I told him, I said, well, listen. I said, if they were members here, it's different. Because then they're saying that they have um, a responsibility to this church, and they're saying that I have a responsibility over them. And uh, I said, but they're just visiting. They're here, they come, they like it, but they're visiting. And they need to grow in the Lord, they need to learn from the Lord, and uh, I just don't feel right now that asking them to stay out until they get married or whatever, uh, I just don't feel like that's right. And um, he didn't say much then. Well, you know, time goes on. A few weeks later, uh, the woman, she comes to the altar, uh, one, I think a Wednesday night, and we're praying, and, and I was praying with her, and she said, she said, I think God is wanting me to be baptized. Well, I didn't really know that she had asked the Lord to save her. I didn't know that. But now that she's asking for baptism, I think, okay, I think I have to address this before I go that far. And so I, uh, I told him, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, let me come to your house, your apartment, and, and visit with you a while, and we'll talk. They, they said, okay. So... Um, when this man, uh, his name was Dale, when he found out, he wanted to go. And I didn't feel comfortable with it, but I thought, well, I'm not going to... I want him to hear what I say so he knows what I'm, where I'm coming from, and maybe he'll learn a little bit. And so I went over there, and, you know, of course, we did the small talk for about 30 minutes and just kind of warming up. And then finally I said, okay, you know, uh, you asked me to 
baptize you. And I said, you know, bef before when you were just coming, you and this man, um, you know, I, I knew that you were living together without marital bonds. And I said, let me guess. If you got married, one of you would lose your benefits. And they said, yeah, that's it. And I said, well, I said, let me tell you. I said, when two people cohabitate without the bonds of marriage, it's called fornication. And I said, it's wrong. It's just wrong no matter what you do, what you say, doesn't matter what time we live in, it's wrong. It was wrong a thousand years ago, it's wrong now. And I said, now, that's not me saying that you can't come to church. We want you to come to church because, you know, obviously God wants to work a work in you and both of you. And, you know, I just, you know, gave them that for the next 20, 30 minutes. And I said, I, I, can't, I can't really baptize you uh, as long as you remain living in this condition. I can't really do it. I said, I have to know that you're saved, that you're right with God. I'm not asking you to be perfect, but I also can't just ignore this situation now that I know about it. And so they said, well, we understand, you know, I guess we'll have to make that decision, you know, what we want to do. Uh, I found out a while later, because I saw the guy at a flea market one time, he was selling stuff, and, and I talked to him, he said she kicked him out months after that. So I went, okay, that solved that problem. The guy that had a problem with it left. Quit coming. Because he felt like I was too soft on him, and I should have thrown him out, and not let him back in until they got married. And I'm like, I, it's not that way. It's our first responsibility to restore people in a spirit of meekness. Not pointing the finger and saying, you did this and we cannot have that. I will not tolerate it in my church. Don't come back. Okay? Um, you really got to push me hard to get me to do that. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You're the next one in line. It's going to be you. Who's next? And this falls in line with do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you wouldn't want to be kicked out, then don't kick them out. And Jesus gave us a whole process to follow. And following it is the right thing to do. And following it in the right spirit here is the right thing to do. That, that falls in line with submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That means that even though I'm your pastor, I'm your servant. That means that I present myself to you as a servant leader. I'm willing and must be willing to do whatever it takes to keep you on the right track, to love you, to love the things that you care about, to see you as important in the kingdom of God, that's my responsibility, but it falls on everyone to be that way. Some people don't want to do that. They ought, I, I, I was talking to a, a fellow pastor one time, he, um, Pete Rubel. And he said, we were talking about it, and he said that he's got a guy in his church, and he said every time he finds out some, about somebody over there, he's got, he comes to me saying, Pastor, I think we need to do church discipline on him. I mean, right away, let's hold a meeting and let's vote them out because they did something wrong. And, you know, there was some pretty serious problems over there at that church. And there was some people just living in sin and doing all kinds of crazy things. And it involved somebody in his family. And he had to try to wade through all that and still be the pastor. And uh, I felt bad for him. But to have somebody in your church that's always pointing a finger at somebody saying, we need to get them out of here. They did that. That doesn't, that's not Christ. It's not Christ-like. There's one person coming to this church right now that if I would have dismissed them years ago, we would have robbed our church of all the years of blessing with this person. I'm not even going to tell you who, I'm even going to hint at who it is. But needless to say, God took care of the issue that I had. God did it. I didn't do it. 
And if you knew the situation, you'd say, yep, God did it. Bear ye one another's burdens, verse 2, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Whose burdens? Bear ye one another's burdens. Fulfilling the law. What's the law of Christ? Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. The accuser is the same as the guilty party. Because like it says, the accuser is going to be next. And Jesus already said, with the judgment that you judge other people with, that judgment will fall on you. So if you go around judging everybody critically and harshly and making it like there's a fine line, and if they cross that, if they toe that line, they're going to be, they're going to face the wrath of, of the church. If people are thinking that all the time, they're not going to come here and worship. They're not going to come here and love on people and be loved by people. And it, and it is, it's pure pride. The situation that I spoke of back when I was a young man, a young boy, that was 100% pride. All pride. Um, and other things that I've seen over the years. Pure pride. When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. You have a responsibility to make yourself. I mean, this is not anything that Jesus didn't already teach about. The splinter. The beam. If you got a beam in your eye, you cannot rail on John here, the deacon, slap, 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 about the splinter in his hand. You got nothing to say. You got to take care of your own stuff first. Let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Wait a minute. Er, contradiction? Bear you one another's burdens? Every man shall bear his own burden. Which is it? Both. Both. One of it is, mind your own business. Keep your nose on your side of the fence. Amen? Don't sit and worry about what everybody else does. You worry about what you do. You let God talk to you about you. You don't be going, Brother Mike, God's telling me something about somebody in this church. Let God deal with you first. Amen? Every man shall bear his own burden. But then, if somebody comes to us and says, Man, I got a problem. Bear you one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. That's how it ought to be. 2 Corinthians 1, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Look at that. Do not forget how merciful God is. I'm going to show you something. Oh, let's see here. Let's sweep that with the besom of destruction. And... One of my favorite, oh, apparently, maybe I got it wrong. Ah, forever is two words. There we go. Let me find that one. Forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 106, his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 107. Psalm 118, it's in every verse. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever, forever. Forever, 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 forever. Psalm 136, I mean. Forever, his mercy endureth forever, his mercy endureth forever. How long does his mercy endure? Forever and forever and forever. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. What? 26 verses where his mercy endureth forever. That's enough, isn't it? Do you get what it's saying? His mercy endureth forever. He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation. You know what I know about most people who are truly right with God? I don't have to just keep coming down from the pulpit and condemning everything they do. If you are right with God, you're already dealing with the Holy Ghost working at you. And I'm just going to bring out the scripture 
hopefully led by, I got a letter on my desk, bless my heart today, guy said he's been watching, uh, I think since 2014, I want to know where he was before that. But anyway, he'd been watching since 2014, and he said, you know, Pastor Mike, all those sermons where you say, uh, where maybe God changes the sermon, and you say, now, I don't know who this is for, but I think God's changed the message. He said, they're for me. Every one of them was for me. And he said, I've listened to just about everything you've had to say. That's a blessing. And it helps people when they know that I'm, preaching against my own sins my own stupidity it encourages it encourages them not to go out and sin encourages them to seek mercy uh, for as the sufferings of christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by christ and whether we be afflicted it is for your consolation and salvation so if something bad is going to happen to me or in my life or whatever as long as it turns out to be a blessing for somebody I care about somebody I love or somebody just in general I'm okay with that I may not say that while I'm going through it but on the other side of it I say that's why that's why whether we be afflicted is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. I will go through things. I have gone through things. I will continue to go through things. Some public, some private. Um, I deserve privacy, like everybody else does. But some of the things I don't mind talking about. I don't mind telling you. I'm, I'm this way, I'm this way, I'm this way. And uh, I'm just telling you, I am not any different than anybody else and never will be other than God has tasked me with giving you what he said uh, in a way that you can understand. And um, that doesn't make me different than anybody else. But there is a responsibility on my part to make sure I do it. I've seen pastors abuse authority. And there's, there's a video, it's a very famous video on YouTube uh, of a pastor ranting and raving against people in his church, calling them out by name and verbally abusing them as if they deserved it. And the poor people there are going, Amen, brother, amen, I know I got it coming. And I'm like, that is not how you do it. James chapter 5, look at here. Is any sick among you? What does it say to do? Let him call for the elders of the church. You know what that is? That's us taking on your burden. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We do that. If you are sick and you want us to pray over you, we will pray over you. We will, we will ask God in faith, nothing wavering. We will believe that God has an answer. We believe that that answer is full of grace so that no matter what God does, He's going to give you a great big semi-tractor trailer load of grace and mercy. Amen. And, they sh and if He have committed sins, they shall be forgiven Him. Oh, I forgot to read the first part. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if He have committed sins, they shall be forgiven Him. Confess. And what did Jesus do when they brought people to Jesus to be healed? What did he do first that really irritated the Pharisees? Forgave their sins. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. What? You did what? Well, which is easier, for me to forgive their sins or to say, be thou healed? So he heals them and he says, see, I can do both. Um, look at verse 16. Confess your faults one to another now that's not the verse that tells us to put in a confessional I wouldn't want one I don't want to hear what you got um, but it does tell us and this applies to me too to tell other people 
things that you don't do that are right or things that you do that are wrong. Um, and in that sense, what you're doing is you're humbling yourself to people and letting them know, hey, I am no different than anybody else. I'm, I said it this morning. How many of us are, are we're here because we want to go to heaven. That's the most important thing. And so confessing our faults one to another. And I'm going to say this too. Don't do it on Facebook. If you don't want everybody to find your business out, don't put it on Facebook. Because I guarantee you, knowing somebody digitally is not the same as knowing them personally. And you may think you've got a real friend who lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay? But they may just be somebody that the devil sent to make your life miserable because everything that you share with them, they're going to put it out on the internet. There are people who just wait for me to say something that they can attack. And it's not so bad now as it used to be. I don't know what the deal is. I haven't been attacked in videos in a long time. Maybe I'm not doing something right. But I, there for a while, I had one guy in particular that, that called here to try to trip me up in something, I, and, he, and he cut out something that I said to make it sound like that I was flipping on doctrine. And he made a video on that. And um, that, that stuff happens. It, so when it, you go to confess faults to people, be careful. Be careful. You could end up, and I'm going to say this, especially you ladies. It seems like that is an issue that runs deep in womanhood. That of a gossip or that of a false friend who just lures people in, pretends to be their friend, takes them under their wing, gives them comfort, get to, says all kinds of things about them, and then turns on them. And then pretty soon, everything that you told that person gets blabbed to everybody. If you're going to confess faults to somebody, make sure that it's something that you wouldn't mind getting up and saying in church publicly. Amen. Uh, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual... Fervent, underline this, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You say, well, I'm nobody. God, I want Pastor Mike to pray for me because I'm nobody. Pray. Your prayer. You pray. God will hear you like he hears me. Same as, not different than. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. That means he flipped out sometimes or he didn't see things the way they really were sometimes. He was down in the mouth or whatever. He had problems and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's some kind of prayer. And do you think he got loud with it? God, God, please don't let it. Do you think he did that? If he did, he didn't have to. Prayer is a prayer. And whether you thrust emotion into it or you just simply say, God, teach these people a lesson. I love them, but teach them a lesson. Don't let it rain for three and a half years. One prayer, one time, God did it. And then he prayed again, verse 18, and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. I wonder if there's somebody, and I already know the answer to this, if there's somebody that will end up in hell because we refused to love them. We refused to to help them, we refused to care enough about them to try to give them the gospel, to try to share Jesus,
to try to let them know we care about them, we love them. I just wonder, I already know the answer to it, but I just, I wonder how many people will go to hell because I didn't care enough. There's not much I can do about what's happened in the past, but I can try to change the future. Amen.